prolific and popular author and thinker and speaker. Indeed, I've heard him speak many times, and I'm sure that you will enjoy his comments. Thank you, Aubrey. It's great to be here. And to echo some of what Aubrey was just saying, you know, the latter half or the latter portions of the trajectory of life are pretty brutal. What we love is eventually taken away from us as we, as we age, our senses diminish, we lose our friends, our family, our loved ones, and eventually we die. And as Shakespeare put it, I think very well, and so from hour to hour we write and write, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, <laughs> and thereby hangs a tale. And you know, things haven't really changed very much since Shakespeare said that. And so dealing with aging and death has always been a challenge, and uh, people have different ways of dealing with that. And I see it in basically four categories. One way is, well, just ignore it. Well, that's pretty easy to do. You can pretend it isn't happening. It's particularly easy when you're young and when the manifestations of aging aren't really apparent at all. So that's an easy way. Another is you, den you deny it. Death isn't really real because our soul will live eternally or we're going to live eternally through our creations uh, or through our accomplishments, those sorts of things. And you know, a lot of people like to feel that. It makes them feel a little bit better about the situation. Another is just to accept it. And that's a pretty common practice too, to say, well, it's inevitable, it's natural, it's even the best thing. And there, uh, Leon Cass, for example, has said that, you know, it's life's finitude that gives it its meaning, as though, you know, young people who don't think about that don't seem to enjoy life very much. Um, the final thing is to battle it. And that used to be a Ponce de Leon who was, you know, trekking around, wandering around in the jungles of Florida, uh, it could be Aubrey de Grey, who's trying to generate a, to catalyze a very serious effort to control the aging process. And what's different is that suddenly, for the first time ever, it's actually quite plausible, as you heard in the, er among earlier, the comments of earlier speakers, that we would actually be able to accomplish that. And what's interesting it, it, is that this isn't the uh, goals of biogerontology today. It's not to control aging, not to uh, be able to shape it or to slow it down. It's to basically extend, not to extend our natural lifespan, it's to be able to somehow compress morbidity so that we can be healthy for a longer period of time and then, you know, the morbidity would be uh, a shorter period. So we stay healthy and then we fade away quickly. And, you know, initially that sounds reasonable, but at its logical conclusion, it really is completely out of sync with our aspirations. Because, you know, where would it lead us? Imagine that you actually could retain youthful vigor for whatever, a normal human lifespan, uh, 70, 80 years, and then in a matter of a month, you would just sort of salmon-like deteriorate, say, painlessly, and you'd be gone, just enough time to say your goodbyes. Well, you know, I don't think that would really be a blessing because without the ever-worsening uh, debilities that really wrench us away from our lives, that prepare us, that separate us from the process of living and our interactions with others, uh, we would be wrenched from our prime. It would be very difficult. And not only that, we'd you leave this gaping hole behind us among all the people we were interacting with. It would be very, very painful. It's not something that we would welcome. And certainly, if human lifespan is immutable, then more health is it's a great thing. I would like to have that. But our true aspirations are not for compressed morbidity. They're for longer, healthier lives. Uh, it really isn't that hard to see that. And what's amazing is that this is actually a plausible goal today. And so I say, why not go for it? And at least it seems as worthy a project for us as space exploration or maybe creating an atom bomb. Um, I, I will argue that to not pursue this is really a huge mistake, that it is a failure of our, would be a failure of our generation that would be seen as such by future generations. And that we should really mount essentially a war on aging, where aging is not seen as a disease, 
but it is the key disease. It's one that afflicts everyone. It cripples, it kills, and just might somehow, as you've heard earlier, be handled in some way, be treatable. And perhaps not for us, but for our children. What a legacy, what a gift. You know, maybe for us. I got a fortune cookie that said that I was going to enjoy great longevity. Yesterday I got that fortune cookie, <laughs> which is encouraging to me, but it didn't say whose longevity, so I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Now, seeing aging as a disease is not mainstream, not yet. But really, our concept of disease has really shifted a great deal. It's shifted from viewing it as a cluster of adverse symptoms, that we really have to be sick, essentially, to a state of being that places us at increased risk of adverse consequences. So a state that places us at increased risk of adverse consequences. And that was from science uh, a few years ago. Well, aging is just this. It's what makes us old. It's what brings on cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all the aging-related diseases. And it debilitates, it kills. So the idea of striving for an extended lifespan has until now seemed really rather futile. And it's also been sort of colored with this sense that it's somehow unworthy, that it's narcissistic. Because we celebrate the nobility of self-sacrifice, the idea, the heroism of risking death for others, for the common good. So reaching for extended lifespan, it evokes images that are sort of, you know, cowards on the deck of the Titanic, pushing women and children aside as they race for the lifeboats. Or, you know, hypochondriacs who are counting their vitamins and trying not to get old. Or, those engaged with caloric restriction who are starving themselves and look emaciated for a little bit of extra life. Um, or vampires sucking the blood of innocence. So there are all these images that are associated with seeking extra life. But you know, if there actually were meaningful breakthroughs in aging research, it would change all of that because it would draw the pursuit into mainstream medicine, into the realm of medicine, rather than fantasy. And Extra years, or seeking extra years, would seem common sense, sort of like using antibiotics or vaccines or other things we do that play God. Why wouldn't you do that? So the question is, can we justify really spending the money and the resources to go after this, to go after these breakthroughs? And to sort of uh, put that in perspective and to examine it, I want to propose that there should be a serious aggressive, publicly funded program with the express goal of trying to extend vital, healthy lifespan and do it by, the, by retarding the aging process itself. And I think there's a good justification for that, and so let's look at that. So first of all, I want to be clear about what I'm proposing. First, not privately funded. Nobody would argue with privately funded. People can spend their money the way they want. I'm talking about taking public funds not targeting specific diseases. There's a lot of that already. The aging process itself. And I'm not talking about a timid exploration to see whether this is plausible, how long it would take, should we spend money. I mean a robust, well-funded effort to really go after it, something like the Manhattan Project. And so, should we take a shot at what previous generations have only dreamed of? I mean, it wasn't even possible to do something like this before, to control the aging process. And, you know, let's be clear, we're talking about human enhancement. People don't like the idea of enhancement. Of course, if you controlled aging, it would be therapy as well, because there are lots of diseases of aging that you'd have to control as well. But, you know, the focus of it would be health span, because actually, another 20 or 30 years of added decrepitude is not what most people aspire to. So more life without more health wouldn't be of great value. But ironically, this seems to be the focus of a great deal of medicine today. Why is that? It seems to me a little bit of it is because our views about what is acceptable begin to change as we really get to those points where uh, we see things that would have been seemed unbearable initially, and now we say, well, actually, you know, it's not that bad. I remember a time when I thought that to wear glasses would be something unbearable, that I don't know how I could go on if I had to do that, and uh, it doesn't seem that way anymore. 
Um, and the second thing is that we don't want to face it. We don't want to acknowledge that given current options, lots of times, death is really the best choice. And we're very uncomfortable with making decisions about when to pull the plug. So I can get into the structure of what the program would be, how it would be funded, but you know, make it simple. Think of uh, something like the California stem cell effort, you know, Proposition 71, three billion uh, devoted to embryonic stem cells. Uh, the question is, what is the justification? There are very, very strong arguments. So the first and most obvious one, it seems to me, is that if it were successful, there would be very substantive uh, individual benefit. A lot of people argue that that's not the case, or some people will, but it seems pretty obvious to me. And I think that were those interventions possible, that lots and lots of people would embrace them enthusiastically. And I don't say that based on some theoretical projection about how people will behave. People spend a fortune on just trying to obtain, you know, the, the appearances of the continued youth. You know, all the things that we spend on cosmetics and the, the efforts to just try and capture a little bit of that. So if something real existed, it would be extraordinary. But you know, that's not enough to justify the use of public funds in a massive program because some people don't really desire the possibility. Many people believe that this success is unachievable or at least of a very, very low probability and there are lots of other goals that people see as important. So a program like this would be aligned with individual benefit and our desires, but you know, there have to be other reasons that are important, and for, fortunately there are. The second one is that broad social benefit would result. And well, there's the obvious social benefits, which is that social value is really the sum of individual value and benefit. And so if individuals are benefiting, and what metric should we use? Probably the way people evaluate their own lives, the things that people would want. And so, it's natural that there will be social benefits of this, if there are individual benefits, if a lot of people are helped and not very many are injured in any way. Uh, Robert Topel, an economist who looks at these sorts of things, uh, claims that we value our lives to the tune of about $5 million uh, by the choices that we make about what we spend to reduce risks or to preserve health. And so that's a lot of monetary value for life extension. But the, the real social benefit, or a, a significant social benefit that is not obvious, is that it takes a long time to get to the point where you actually can contribute effectively to the world, where you figure out how things work and you can really handle yourself well. There's a lot of expenditure that society makes in education and all these sorts of things to get you to that point, and then you're just beginning to slow down. Well, that's not very good. And then later in life, you really are withdrawing resources largely, or most people are. So if you could expand the period of one's prime by 20 years or 30 years or more, what an efficiency that would be. And Topel tried to calculate what the value was of previous extensions in life expectancy, the doubling from 1900 roughly. And he's calculated uh, by some pretty kind of uh, arcane methods, but basically, that it's about three trillion dollars a year. And that basically half of the increase in life ex of uh, our quality of life, of the increase in standard of living, comes from increased life expectancy. So that's a pretty big value, that's great. But still, there are lots of worthy demands on public money, and you know, a few billion dollars, that's a lot of money. So what other justifications? Well, I think there are some that are even stronger, that are really obvious. There, the direct monetary return to the public would far exceed the cost. So, if you were able to extend lifespan and just delay it a little bit, you'd have huge savings in healthcare costs, which is half a trillion a year, and in Social Security of half a trillion a year if you just made some obvious adjustments to Social Security. Uh, so, a program to achieve delays in the onset of all the debilities of old age has a tremendous payback, and it's justified even if the probability of success is almost minuscule. I mean, if you're talking about a trillion dollars spent in these programs each year, it doesn't take much to justify a few billion dollars. So that's a strong argument for it. A second thing is that it could be, the funding of it could be very, very fair. And by that I mean 
then it could be funded by the people who will derive value from it. It could be funded virtually entirely by a reduction in future benefits to seniors. And there are a lot of people that would be quite comfortable with the idea of reducing future benefits, perhaps ones that will be taken away anyway, for the chance at extended longevity. And so it wouldn't necessarily compete with present spending, especially if you use bond offerings and things of that sort that uh, would become due at later periods. So that's the second reason that is very difficult to argue against. The third is that it's so aligned with other efforts that we've already embraced. Uh, it's consistent with the vast push to treat diseases of aging because if you actually could make progress with the underlying mechanisms of aging, it would have an automatic impact on those other diseases. So that's a third reason. And a fourth is that it would be such good business. The program would be terrific value to any entity or nation that really embraced it very aggressively. An example of that is the whole green environmental movement, where to be at the leading edge of that sort of swell of effort is very, very valuable versus being at the trailing edge of that kind of development. And I think that it's clear that the global appeal of added health and longevity is such that if there really is a potential for making, if, if it really comes to pass, that we can make those sorts of uh, controls or interventions in aging, their fortune is going to be involved in spin-offs of a variety of sorts. So if you really have a center of that activity, here rather than elsewhere, it will be of enormous, enormous value. So you want to be ahead of this curve. So I said that one way of structuring, and I think the, be uh, the best way, or a very good way, would be an initiative like California Prop uh, 71. Two billion, three billion, four billion. Do it in a structured 10 to 20 year program. And don't waste all the money like you did on California Stem Cell uh, Initiative where it's all being sucked into buildings and all that kind of stuff. You could actually hire a thousand postdoctoral researchers. Imagine that, a thousand researchers for maybe a hundred million a year that would be devoted to that area, the best of you, trying to do that for 10, 20 years. What would all the spin-offs be in medicine and gerontology from some, an effort like that, located here in California or wherever it was? To me, that would be something that you could sell in, a, in an initiative, even with reductions in future benefits of some sort, which people tend to, to uh, devalue anyway, because they're to undervalue in some way. They're willing to forego because they're so distant. And I think that not to do this is really, would be to squander all of the possibilities that are coming out of this sort of the fruit that is being born by the revolution in biotechnology and molecular biology that's happening right here in our lives at this instant in time and not to go the next step. I mean, this wasn't to find out how biology works. It was, although we're all curious, it was to hope to apply that to ourselves in some way that would benefit and add to our lives. And I think that future generations, if we delay this sort of thing, will really wonder how we could not do this, how we would be so blind as to not do this and potentially render them among the last generations not to enjoy the benefits of this kind of progress rather than among the first to enjoy the, those benefits. And there's a question whether people today around will be able to uh, get value from that. So I'd spend those things very wisely. And so to summarize, here we are, we're at the start of a new millennium. And, you know, long before the end of the next millennium, and still, that's just an instant. 100 years, how long is it gonna be? Future humans are gonna look back at this moment and they're gonna see it as this challenging, chaotic moment in history. And they're gonna forget most of it, that sort of stuff though. They're gonna say, what an extraordinary moment to have been alive. That was the instant when all of the things were started, basically, occurred that laid down, that shaped our lives and the nature of our society. Artificial intelligence, telecommunications, the Human Genome Project, understanding human biology, space exploration, all these things are going on right now. And in my view, 
It's at the ragged frontiers of aging that the real action is going to be. And that's because our next frontier is not as imagined in the 1960s, space. It's our own bodies. It's us. Because we care a lot more about us than we do about out there. And getting old is central to our lives. And this is going to be a tremendous focus. And it becomes, as it becomes understood that we really might intervene in these processes, I think it is going to be just a, a huge swell of effort in that area. So thank you very much.